I had to cut one of the songs because I just wanted to get up here and, and talk to everybody. How's everybody feeling this morning? I hope you're fired up about your faith. I, I hope you are in love with God. How'd you enjoy the GLC? I know God moved in a great way. A number of us have taken breaks. Now we're back, ready to go, ready to go out and start inviting people to God's family and to God's church. So excited about this fall and all the things that we're going to do on our campus. So excited about our singles ministry this fall. So excited about our marriage ministry this fall. So excited about our teen ministry this fall. So excited about our women of honor our mature women's ministry this fall as well. You know, we're going to uh, be uh, doing a lesson today. We're going to start our first principles uh, series. And I'm, I'm, at some point, I'm going to get to the first principle scriptures. But because y'all think y'all know everything about seeking God, I'm going to share some things that maybe you don't know. So everybody's going to learn something today. Amen. I think if y'all get fired up, the Holy Spirit's going to move and start doing something in your life. I appreciate you so much. I, I know who you are. I know you are the sons and daughters of God. I consider it an honor to be able to speak to you uh, this morning. It, it's truly a pleasure to be able to talk to God's sons and daughters. And I know you've devoted your life to seeking and finding and walking with God and meeting him again one day up in heaven. And as a staff here in Metro Heights, it is our goal to help you get there. We're going to do everything in our power to help you get to heaven. Amen. Even if some of you act up, we still are going to help you. There's nothing, nothing more important than seeking God in your life. Nothing should be more of a priority in your life than seeking God in a dynamic and awesome relationship with God. On, in fact, if you do that first in your life, you are going to have quite a life. Your life is going to be so successful and unbelievable and blessed in every way. You say, what if bad stuff happens to you? God's going to help you through it. Come on. Bad stuff's going to happen to you anyway. You going to help yourself through it or you going to let the master help you get through it in your life? You know, I'm so excited because my son started dating last night. I've been grooming him all his life to be able to date a woman and get married one day. You know, I've told him to use Noxzema on his face. I've taught him how to brush his hair and smell good and all that stuff y'all sisters like. So he comes over about an hour before he asked uh, Alicia, who he's dating now, to be his girlfriend. And he walked in, and I didn't even know my son. He walked in in these awesome shades. He was walking with all kind of swagger, all cool and everything. He had just gotten his hair cut. You know, I looked at his hair, and I started getting seasick because the waves was on point. I was just like, stop it. You know, I put my arm around him, I hugged him. He had been working out and training and doing Thai bow or something because he was all cut up here in the middle. I mean, his, his, his stomach was just like ripples. I started to take out the laundry and start doing laundry on his belly. I mean, he was amazing. And I was so proud of him. You know, it's amazing what we're willing to do for love. You know, I love David because nobody sought after the Lord's heart like David did. The Bible says in 1 Samuel, you don't have to turn there, just listen to me. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, go read it later. It says that David was a man after God's own heart. You know, there's nothing like a man going after the heart of someone else. It was nothing like my son going after Alicia's heart. I mean, you should have seen how cut up. Jonathan's been all pudgy for years until he started wanting Alicia. Now he's solid. 
Hair was all out of place. Now the waves, I mean, it's incredible. You know, I think about Mario and Michelle. You know, Mario was playing around until he started getting serious about Michelle's heart. I heard about how Aaron went after Sheila's heart. He doesn't want me to put his business out there. I was willing to do anything to get Emma's heart. I was in college spending money on her that I did not have. But I got her heart. David was a man after God's own heart. The longest book in the Bible is an expression of his love for God. The book of Psalms. Over 145 uh, chapters. A man after God's own heart filled with, with poems and singing and expressions of love for God. David wrote a Psalms in Psalms chapter 63. Let's, let's examine that for a minute. Let's see if we can even relate to what it means on, to be a man or woman after God's own heart. Does that describe you this morning? Are you a man or woman after God's own heart? If you are, I should be able to insert your name right here in Psalm 63. Don't play with it. There's one thing about going after somebody's heart. There's another thing about being infatuated. Where are my infatuated Christians? And where are my Christians who are after God's own heart? Those Christians that are searching profoundly and deeply. You know, David writes this song, Psalms, as a king. This is a king after God's own heart. Somebody you would think that has everything. It has no need for God. Way more than you have. But look at how David goes after God's heart. Psalm 63 and verse 1. The Bible says, you God are my God. Can I get an amen church? Amen. Some of y'all just need to say that. Amen. You God. You're my God. Stop calling yourself your God. Stop calling that, that, that boyfriend or that girlfriend or that husband or those kids your God. Stop calling the world your car, your education, your God. Come on. Start letting God be your God like the king. Amen. Earnestly I seek you. David wasn't playing around with it. He said, earnestly, I seek you. The idea of earnestness here is that of a miner or a merchant who's going after the most valuable stone. Would have been like the, the, the miners during the gold rush era, sifting through the waters, just trying to find gold. That's what it means to be earnest with God. You go after the most valuable relationship, and certainly God is the most valuable relationship. Amen. Amen. All that stuff that's no value that you put in, in your little shaker, throw that stuff away. Amen. Go and throw that little raggedy car away. You're searching for God. That's what it means to earnestly seek after God. He says, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I don't know if you've ever been thirsty before, but you don't forget thirstiness, do you? Some of y'all, the only way to satisfy your thirst is with a little Kool-Aid. I'm thirsty. Thank you, bro. I appreciate that. I'm not thirsty. But can you imagine not having water? You know, when we don't have bottled water, I go on over to the tap and get some water. Emma hates that. I'm like, I'm thirsty. God is with this tap water. <laughs> Certainly, David's heart was in a desert, but he was surrounded by a desert. And he'd wake up in the morning and he'd look out over the desert and the dry, parched land and he would think, man, that's how I am for God. I'm so thirsty. I so long. It's like a dry, my, my desire for God is like a dry, parched land. I'm thirsty for God. I need a drink of God this morning. Some of us are drinking the wrong stuff. 
What you need is a drink of God. Are you with me, church? He goes on, he says, I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. Somebody needs to preach this Psalms this morning. Is it me? Am I the one? Okay. He says, your love is better than life. Does that describe your relationship with God? Don't say it if you don't mean it. That may be the difference between you being a man and woman after God's own heart and David. He says, God, your love to me is, is better than life. You know, this Psalms allows us to just peer into David's relationship with God. What an emotional Psalms coming from a king. He goes on, he says, I will praise you as long as I live. Somebody say amen. Amen. Is that you? Some of us are hoping to just make it another week. Man, I'm going to praise you as long as I live, God. I've already decided because I'm seeking after you. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. When's the last time you just lifted them up and you wasn't ashamed? I dare you to go outside today and just walk around. So what, 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 what about what people think? You're in love, right? Love makes you do crazy things. He says, I'll lift up my hands. I'm not ashamed. I will be fully satisfied with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. I I really want to just park right here. But we don't have time. Amen? Amen. But go back and look at this. He says, you know what, God? I'm going to be fully satisfied with you. Go and raise your hand if you need to repent. If you haven't fully been satisfied with God. If you needed some other stuff. To satisfy. Go ahead. If y'all ain't raising your hands, then I'm going to have some time with y'all. Because all of us struggle with discontentment in our lives from time to time. All of us think from time to time we need a little bit more to satisfy us. No, God, God, you're all I need. This was the king saying this. You're all I need. I'm going to sing. My my, my lips are going to be singing to you. You know, almost every time we get in the car, Emma just starts singing. I don't even get to hear the radio anymore. It's just I get to hear Emma. 102 point Emma. But I love it. I love how she sings around the house. You know, and then I sneak in the back and sing because I'm not trying to hurt nobody's ears back there. But how's your singing? How's your singing of God? If you're seeking God, it's just going to pour out of your heart. You know how when you're in love with somebody, you go, oh, I love Derek, I love Lisa. I did it. You know, you just start singing, right? Yeah. You know, if you had a sandwich that tastes good, you bite into that sandwich. <laughs> you sing to your food. You need to sing to your God, too. He says, I'm going to sing to you. The praise of you is going to be on my lips. On my bed, I remember you. I, you. I can't even sleep. You know how when you're really in love with somebody, you just lay there and look up at the ceiling, don't you? Yeah. And you just think about them. You know, David said, man, that's how, I, that's how I do with God. On my bed, I remember you. Bless you. I think of you through the watches of the night. You know, a lot of times when I'm really doing well spiritually, I just wake up and get all kind of insights and nuggets from God's Would you ever do that ever happen to you? You know, you're sleeping and you're just like, oh, man. (laughs) Then you share that with somebody and they think you're super insightful and God just gave that to you in your sleep, right? You're like, where do you get that insight from? God. Some of my greatest insights have come during the watches of the night. How about you? Come on, yeah. Some of y'all haven't woken up in the middle of the night with God in years. 
because you're not thinking about God during the day. Because you're my help, I will sing in the shadow of your wings. Verse 8, I cling to you. What's it like when a kid clings to your leg? Don't you love it when a kid just runs up to you and hops on that leg and you're just, you know, you try to shake them off and you can't, and you just, is that how you are with God? Man, I'm just going to cling to you. Can we take our relationship up a level with God, church? I cling to you, your right hand holds me up. Who do we give the credit for what we are in our lives today? Who are you giving the credit for waking you up? This, you think you woke yourself up, don't you? You just woke up because you're awesome, right? God held you up. Some of us give God so little credit. If it wasn't for God, you would not be here right now. Your life would be in turmoil. He says, you hold me up with your right hand. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. How many of us have haters? <laughs> what does God do to your haters in your life? I mean, honestly, I feel sorry for my haters. I'm like, please don't mess with me. Because God is going to get you. I've been walking with him for 38 years. You in trouble. L leave me alone. Don't be putting your finger up at me because I accidentally ran into your lane. Just leave me alone. You don't know who you're messing with. Verse 10. They will be given over to the sword. You see that person next time and they're all broke up and everything. I told you not to mess with me. I'm a Christian. Verse 11. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him. Is that you and I? While the mouths of liars will be silent. This was the heart of a king who loved God. You know, this past week we lost an incredible legend in Aretha Franklin. And what a life, what a talent, what a, what a gift. She was so good. They said, you know, of all the women that have ever sang before in the history of women, you're the queen. You're the queen of soul. And you can read articles and books about Aretha and you can find magazines about her life. You can learn all about her personality, her character, her habits, her family life, and you'll find an imperfect person. But it's still not the same reading all of those things as actually knowing the queen of soul. Y'all yeah. have friends who say they know famous people and they really don't know them. I mean, they may have been in the same room and they're like, oh, wow, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth is my best friend because I was in London. <laughs> to know somebody, there has to be an introduction. You, you have to be introduced to them. You have to shake their hand and say, I'm... James Haynes, the singing baptism. And they, in turn, have to tell you who they are. And, and you're introduced and you get to know them and you meet them. And then you spend hours and hours and days and time with them after the introduction to get to know that person and find out more and more about them and to have dialogue and interaction and connectivity with that person. As the relationship begins to develop, you discover more and more and more about that person. And then at some point after that, then you can declare, I know you. Yeah. Turn over to John chapter 17. Come on, bro. 
John 17 and verse 3, the Bible says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You know, John says it's God's will that not only do we seek him, but that we know God. And again, in order to know God, there must be a time when we specifically are introduced to God. Where, where we meet God uh, face to face and, and, and we know him and, and we're introduced to him. And that time is in baptism. Amen, church. And in baptism, we're introduced to God. We turn away from our sin. And Jesus becomes Lord of our life, and we love him, and we trust him. Amen, church? Amen. Then as we move on from there, we develop a relationship with, by spending time with God in our quiet times, by being trained and being taught and instructed through others. And over the months and over the years, we get to know God better and better and better. And so what does that mean? Seeking God means to seek his presence. In the Hebrew teaching, the idea of, of seeing God or experiencing God face to face is, is what that literally means in Hebrew. Look over in Psalms chapter 27. And so when we're talking about seeking God, we're talking about seeking the very face of God. We're talking about seeking God's presence in our lives. You know, today, if you claim to be a person who's seeking God, but you don't feel or experience God's presence in your life, I suggest to you that perhaps you're not seeking God appropriately. Come on. In Psalms 27 and verse 7, the Bible says, hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face Lord, I will seek. Do not reject me. Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my Savior. He says here, God, I, I'm seeking your face. I'm seeking your very presence in my life. You know, a lot of times we fall short in this area and all we do is we seek out a church. On, I, I just want somewhere where I can go and worship at on Sunday. You know, I, I, I have my relationship with God on Sunday, but I do me on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. That's not what it means to seek God. That's not seeking God's face. Sometimes as disciples, we could fall into this. And not make God the priority in our lives that he desires to be. To seek his face means to seek his presence in our lives at all times. Turn with me over to 1 Chronicles chapter 22. I just want to give you some principles to think about when it comes to seeking God and having a dynamic relationship with God. Are you with me, church? Yeah. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, I'm going to give you the scriptures to the Seeking God study in a little bit. All right. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, look with me in verse 19. He says, devote your heart and soul to what? Seeking the Lord your God. Begin to build the sanctuary of the Lord God so that you may bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the sacred articles belonging to, God's, uh, to God into the temple that will be built for the Lord or for the name of the Lord. He says, devote your heart and your soul to seeking the Lord. Now, does this ever get old? No. This is something that we are to continually do. This is something that, that we ought to do all the days of our lives. Are you with me, church? Matthew 16, verse uh, 22 says, Love the Lord your God with all of what? Your heart, 
your soul, your mind, and your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. You know, this, this is to be the focus of our life as disciples, seeking God. How many of you play dominoes? A lot of y'all. I still have not learned. Somebody's got to teach me at some point. But you know, what's interesting. If you go on the internet and, you know, I, I kind of like, Records and I, 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 I like Guinness Book of World Records. So I went on the internet to see what, what is the most dominoes that if you touch the first one, all the other ones fall. The, the, the record for the most dominoes in the Guinness Book of World Records is 4,345,027 dominoes. Over 4 million dominoes. It took two days to set up all of those dominoes. And then after you hit that first one, it took two hours for them all to go down. How many of you want to break the record? That's too much. That's too much work. But you know, seeking God is like that in our lives. God is that first domino. When God is that first domino, everything and everything else just follows suit. And for a lot of us, because God isn't that first domino, something else is that first domino. We push it and it doesn't go down. It, it just stands right there. Or, or maybe one domino falls and we wonder, well, what's wrong with my life? Why, why is it my life working? Because you got the wrong domino at the head of the class. And you've got to get the domino of God first and foremost in your life. That's what it means to seek God. Amen, church? Amen. Turn over to Isaiah 55. Because this takes effort. This is something that you've got to consciously make a priority in your life. You've got to decide, you know what? My relationship with God is going to be the number one focus in my life. And if you don't have a relationship with God, this, this may be your hour. This may be your time that God has chosen for you to seek him and find him. And if you're struggling as a Christian, this may be your time to change your life Amen. and to turn your life around. Come on, bro. Isaiah 55 and verse 6, it says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Sometimes we can get to a point where God has just been there standing right in front of you. It's not like God is lost. You're the one that's lost. Not God. God isn't saying go and find something that's lost, that's buried somewhere. He's saying I'm right here. Seek me while I may be found. Call on him while he's near. For some of us, today is your day to repent and change. There may be things in your life that God is calling you to change once and for all. And today is the day. He may not be able to be found by you after today. Your heart may turn and you could be lost forever. Maybe this lesson is for you. There may be some of you, you're here visiting for the first time and you've been saying, I'm going to get my life right with God. Come on. And, and you heard this lesson and this passage right here is your passage. Seek him while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. How is your thinking affecting you spiritually? Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon you know, maybe today God's just going to say, not guilty. Wow. You're pardoned. I freely pardon you. Change and go and sin no more. On, or something worse is going to happen to you. What stops us when we get an invitation like this? Turn over to prop, uh, Psalms chapter 10. On, what an invitation. You would think we would just jump up and down and run to God and have the most awesome relationship with God imaginable, right? 
But something stops us. Proverbs, I'm sorry, uh, Psalms chapter 10. You say, why are you taking so much time with this? Well, God put this on my heart. I don't know. Somebody needs this. Since you haven't even gotten into the first principles. I know. Psalms 10. Verse 4. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. Anybody fill their life up so much that our pride has set in? And now there's no more room in our hearts for the God of the universe. The great obstacle is pride. Humility is essential in seeking God. Yeah. Amen, church? Amen. Let me show you another thing that happens. Turn over to Revelation chapter 2. Come on, bro. That gets in the way of us seeking God. Come on, Revelation chapter 2. This was a whole church here that lost its way. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, he says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You know, sometimes we can get to a point where we don't see God because we've lost our first love. And you know what? When you lose your first love, God holds that against you. Any wife here not hold it against the husband when they don't love you the way they used to? How many husbands have heard that you don't love me the way you used to? Some of us don't love God the way you used to. And he holds it against you. He says, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand. It's about to get dark in your life. About to get dark in your life if you don't love me like you did at first. I remember the guy, the first baptism uh, was my best friend in college. I, I had gotten baptized in October. Uh, my roommate was a guy named Steve Cannon. I studied the Bible with Steve for several weeks. Um, it's a guy from New York, you know, and he had that whole New York, you know, lingo, you know, would call me, you know, kid and yo and all that kind of New York stuff. And I'm like, can you talk English, man? I, I don't understand all of that. And... Um, you know, we studied the Bible, and he got convicted, and he decided, you know, I'm going to make Jesus Lord. And I was like, awesome. So it was really late that Friday night, and he says, I'm going to get baptized tomorrow. And so we go to bed. The next morning, I, I wake up, and there's no Steve. He, he left and went out. I, di I didn't know where he had went. And uh, he, he went, he went uh, over to his mother's house, showered up got his hair all cut, you know, shaved, and put all this cologne on, put on this incredible three-piece suit with a nice red, awesome tie on, you know, was, was sewed together, you know, went out and studied his Bible and prayed, and I mean, literally, he came back to the dorm looking like an angel. It's like, I mean, what college students goes out and does that? You know, I'm in my jeans and T-shirt, let's go get you baptized. He comes back all suited up, I'm ready to go get baptized. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you didn't, why did you do that? You didn't have to do all of that. You were just fine. You, you know, you're going to have to take all that off and put a t-shirt on and get baptized anyway. And I'll never forget, he had these piercing green eyes. He's a black dude with piercing green eyes. And he looked at me and he said, I want to look good when I meet God. Oh. I was so convicted. He says, I'm going to meet Jesus today. I want to look good. Had his shoes shined, everything. And yet some of us won't even come to church on time. I was astonished at the number of people that were late today to Jesus' service. He still loves you and says, come on in, I love you. I bet your boss wouldn't do that. 
Don't be late to Jesus' service. Amen? Amen. Show Jesus respect. It's not about me. It's not about the other leaders. The Bible says where two or more are gathered, I'm there. I believe God is with us today. Don't disrespect God by being late to his worship services. Amen, church? Let's turn that around next week. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. I'm so excited we can look at scriptures and make change in our lives. Amen, church? Aren't you glad God doesn't just get rid of us when we learn that we're not doing what he wants us to do? I would have gotten rid of me a long time ago. So thankful God is not like me. In verse 9 it says, And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind, for the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. What a heavy passage. You know, God gives us a great promise here. He says, you know what? If you decide today you'll seek me, you'll be found by me. How many of us want to find God? I know I do. How many of us want to be rejected by God? Put your hand behind your back if you don't want to be rejected by God. <laughs> Okay, I just want to make sure no hands, no little arms are up there. You know what I mean? So he says, you will be found by me. You know, it's interesting about love and trust. You know, love is one thing. Trust is another thing. It takes a lot to tell somebody you love them. It takes a whole lot more to tell somebody you trust them. In fact, it's easier to say, I love you than it is to say, I trust you. That's why people get married and have prenuptials. I love you, but hey, just sign this right here. And, uh, you know, because I really don't trust you. God knows how much you love him by how much you trust him. Some of us have a hard time trusting God with our lives. With our whole lives. We have a prenuptial with God. Oh, I know you signed it. Oh, God, I love you. I'll come to church. But you can't have this. You can't have my time. I love you, God, but you can't have my career. Sign right here. Then I'll get baptized. God, I love you, but you can't have all of my heart. You can have most of it. But, but there's that part that, that, that got hurt. When I was a kid, you can't have that. Wow. Wow. I love you, God, but you can't have my zeal. There are some you've come to church, you've never said amen. You've never said amen. You've never applauded. <laughs> Give God your zeal. You can't have my singing. Michael and the brothers are working up here so hard. You have that? I don't care if you can't sing. I love it when a brother can't sing and he's the loudest brother in the church. Don't you love that? I've got a prenuptial. You can't have my encouragement. I don't like talking to people. Fellowship break. I'm going downstairs. I'm not talking to anybody. Oh, I love you, but I've got a prenuptial. I want to be saved, but I don't want to save others. I'm not sharing my faith. I'm not bringing a visitor to church. And we all need to turn that around in Metro, amen? <laughs> Starting with me and Emma. We got to get back to bringing people to church in a great way. Are you with us? Yes. 
I love you, but I got a prenuptial with my money. It's a lot of Christians that have prenuptials in the church with their finances. You know, I often wonder, God, why did you choose to allow the world to be evangelized through raising finances? God has just made it this way. Even, even in the scriptures, it, it was this way. That, that disciples and followers of Jesus had to give money in order to evangelize the world. Now, the religious world has exploited this. And in the name of missions and in the name of loving God, preachers will take money and buy Bentleys and large homes. And I, I think that's disgusting. Come on, bro. The sooner God deals with those get-rich-quick preachers, the better. Because yeah. they're false prophets. Yeah. But God does call us to give to raise money to evangelize the world. Yeah. Yeah. To support missionaries. But some of us have a prenuptial in this area. And we've got to change that. We can't say to God, oh, I'm, I'm your son, but my money belongs to me. Now, does that mean we're fiscally irresponsible? Absolutely not. Our, our example, our fiscal responsibility is very, very important. But we've also got to trust that if God asks us to do something, that we can do it. And we can raise money for missions to support missionaries and see the world evangelized. One of the poorest states in the union is South Carolina. One of the lowest per capita incomes in America. Do you know how much the average person gives to charity in South Carolina? $2,500 a year. If the poorest person in South Carolina can give $2,500 a year to charity, we can give $2,500 a year to see people's souls saved. Amen? Look in your Bibles over to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Actually, let's go over to Philippians chapter 4. Because this, this is so important. You know, as we go into the fall mission season... This, this is so important. And, you know, I make no apologies about talking about money to God's people. Because we use money from God's people for God. And here in Philippians chapter 4, in verse 10, Paul says, I greatly rejoice in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. This is a missionary speaking. This is somebody that was on the missionary field planting churches all over the known first century world. He says, indeed, you were concerned, but had no opportunity to show it. The Philippian church was, was some of the most poorest people in that region. And he said, you know, you're concerned about me out here preaching the gospel, but you had no opportunity to show it. And he says in verse 11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. Now, that's true, but that's also not true. He says, I'm not in need. And the reason Paul isn't in need is the next sentence. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And so Paul is saying, I'm in need. This ministry is in need to evangelize the world, but also I'm not in need. Because I've learned to be content no matter what situation I'm in. Because this isn't about me. And he goes on and he says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul says, God wants to use me to evangelize the world, and I'm in need of your finances, but I'm also not in need because God says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, and my hope is in God and not in you. Yeah. And that's the conviction of all of our missionaries around the world. But look in verse 14. He says, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days 
of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid uh, more than once when I was in need. I thought you just said you weren't in need. He isn't in need because he's learned to be content because he's trusting God to supply his need. But he is in need because we need to give to missions to support our missionaries. Amen. And the Philippian Christians did that. And he goes on and he says, it was only except for you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid on more than once, uh, more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is more. Be credited to your account. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied supplied now that I have received from Aphrodite the gift you sent. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. He says, man, I, I, I'm not in need because I've learned how to be content. He says, he says but I, I want something more than just your missionary support. I want what you give to missions to be credited to you. How's your credit? church how's our credit what's your spiritual FICO score looking like right now some of y'all's credit is I know your credit in the world is messed up that's not what we're talking about what's your spiritual FICO score is it 800 when it comes to missions Paul says you know what I, I want God to be pleased with what you give and I want it to be credited to you. I don't know about you, but this last spring's mission was incredible. Yeah. I, I personally sold and fundraised and gave more than anybody in the region. Yeah. And I'm thankful for that. That's what leaders do. Leaders lead the way. Emma was out tagging, had her little green shirt on, out tagging, selling things. And, you know, God blesses that. And I can tell you already, God has given me back even more than what I gave. I, I don't know how it all came back, but he did. How many of you gave in spring mission and God has already blessed you beyond what you gave? Raise your hand. So many of you. Now, some of you are just counting it in terms of money. That, that, that's how you measure God's blessing, just in terms of dollars and cents. Did God give anybody any air over the last oh, yeah. eight weeks? Anybody get any air? Air people? Where? <laughs> How'd you feel if God took that away, took your air away? What would you be willing to pay for that? Would you be willing to pay your missions for that air if he said no more air? You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we lose sight of just how much God is blessing us. I promise you, if you give your missions, God will give it back to you. Because the Bible promises us that. It'll be credited to you. Amen. Let's get over to the Seeking God study. <laughs> turn over to Philippians. I'm sorry. Turn over to uh, uh, Psalms 119. Okay. Come on, come on, John. Seeking God. I really do believe, if, if you, as Aaron said earlier, if, if, if you don't know the Seeking God study, then you're falling short of the Great Commission significantly. There should be no such thing as a disciple that doesn't know how to go through first principles and make a disciple. And so I challenge everyone in our, our church to learn the first principle study and, and learn how to take somebody through God's word and help make them a believer in God. Are you with me, church? Amen. And so here, our first passage in the uh, Seeking God study is in Psalms 119, verse 1. It says, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, whose walk, who walk according to the laws of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statute and seek him with all their heart. 
The idea of blessed here is, is happy, but, but even more than that, from, from a superlative standpoint, happiness here is, is premium happiness, the ultimate happiness, which is really joy. And joy is actually unique to Christians because Christians are called to be joyful no matter what's going on in your life. I think happiness is so overrated. Joy is what we really, really want. And joy is the byproduct of seeking God. Amen. Are you with me right there? You know, uh, turn on over to Matthew chapter 6. He says, when you seek me, uh, you seek me by keeping my commands. In verse 2 of uh, 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 Psalms 119. He says, blessed are those who keep his statutes. Seeking God means that we hold on to God's commands. If you're not paying attention to God's commands and, and if you don't know your Bible, it's hard to obey something that you're not aware of, right? right. You, you know, I, I could give you a math test and if I said, what's one plus one? If you've been taught one plus one is three, what are you going to write down on the exam? Three. three. And so you have to know God's commands in order to obey God's commands. Come on, bro. Look with me then over to Matthew chapter six. What are some other promises that come along with just seeking God? Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, or 25, excuse me. Matthew 6, verse 25. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not soil, sow, or reap, or stow away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not... Even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, and is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? He says, do not worry. And this is a very iconic idea, do not worry. Because you can't add a single day to your life. Can anybody add to their life? How many of us are totally subject to the will and call of God today? When your number is up, what's going to happen to you? Can you do anything about it? That's it. So why are you worried? He says, don't worry about your life. God knows what you need. Anybody going to go home hungry tonight? Anybody not going to have clothes tonight? And who clothes us and who feeds us? You said, well, my job does. No, it doesn't. If you couldn't get to your job, then how could your job pay you? It's God who allows you to get to your job. You know, some of us in, in our youth or, or, or in our vigor, we, we forget that we are totally dependent on God. Something could happen to you this afternoon that could totally change your life and render you helpless. God meets your need. He says you seek first his kingdom and everything else will be given to you. Amen. How many of us have experienced that in our lives? Look over in Acts. The other thing that I just want to point out here in this passage real quick as you're turning over to Acts chapter 17 is he says, are you not much more valuable than all the other things that God has created? You know, a lot of times we don't feel super valuable in God's eyes. One of the reasons you can be and rest assured that you're valuable today is that Jesus gave his one and only son so that you could have salvation. God valued Jesus uh, more than a uh, God valued you more than he valued Jesus living a perfect uh, living on this earth. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, seeking God. 
In Acts 17, in verse 10, he says, As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed. Another characteristic of seeking God is you've got to examine the scriptures on your own. You've got to have a, 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 a noble character like the Bereans and examine the scriptures to see what you're, if what you're being taught is true. I know for me, I, I, I grew up in six generations of Protestants. Uh, my grandfather was a minister. Five of his six sons were ministers. I, I just thought I was saved because they were all ministers. So it just rubbed off on me. And yet when I started examining the scriptures, I realized that my theology was inconsistent with God's word. And I started seeking God. And just like these Bereans, as a result, I found him. And that's the promise. Look over in Jeremiah chapter 29. Another promise that we get from seeking God. Jeremiah chapter 29. I don't hear no Bibles turning. Jeremiah 29. Hang in there. Sometimes the sermons go a little longer. Hang in there. Don't worry about it. You're going to live. Jeremiah 29. In verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Come on, bro. Bible says here that God has a plan for all of us. The God of the universe looks down on our plan and he has a plan for every person. And that plan is to prosper you. That plan is for you to find God and for God to find you. He wants to give you hope and a future. Hope and a future is only possible in Christ. Without Christ, there, there really is no hope. You say, well, I, I can get through my life, but, but then what? After you've gotten through your life, after you've done everything, where's the hope? You say, well, I, I was incredible. I, I was like Jeff Bezos of Amazon and I made all this money. But if you don't have God, where's the future? Where's the hope? God says, I can give you that. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. We don't have time to read all this about the Ethiopian eunuch. But he, he was a religious man looking for God. And the Bible says in verse 26, the angel of the Lord sent Philip to this man. You know, sometimes when we want to seek God, God will intervene and bring people right into your life. And sometimes we don't even know what we're doing. We, we're supposed to be, you know, going to Trader Joe's and we just start walking and we end up over at Ralph's. <laughs> we're like, what am I doing at Ralph's? And then we meet somebody that's open. Yes. And we invite them to church. And God has been working on their hearts. They've been praying for somebody to come in their lives and share God's word. Then you start sharing the word and you realize that they're seeking God and the word is like living water and they just drink it up and become a Christian. Then you know, wow, the angel of God led me to that person. And so understand this, it's no accident when God brings spiritual people into your life. I remember sitting in my dorm room and this little short little guy that was so different than me from Kansas just walked into my dorm room and started talking about God. And I had been praying all summer for God to bring somebody into my life. And I studied the Bible. And that little guy is my spiritual dad. And the faith and baptized me into Christ. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Matthew 7 and verse 7. We're talking about seeking God. How many of us are going to seek God better this week? Yeah. Matthew 7. 
He says, ask in verse 7, it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. God says, you know something, I got a guarantee for you. If you seek me, you're going to find me. If you ask, I'm going to bring help into your life. Some of you are here today because you just asked and God brought that person right on in. Were y'all fire, fired up by the communion today? Yeah. That's, that's this passage. God brought somebody right in to her life. And so that's what seeking God is all about. It's seeking after God with our own heart. Understanding that God is meant to be sought while he can be found. That if you reject God, God will reject you. That we got to put God first. He's got to be the first domino in that stack. And when we put God first, everything else starts working out in our lives. Let's seek God this week. Let's help others seek God and to God be the glory.